Psalms. We're going to go back to Psalms. Very unusual for me to preach out of Psalms twice in one day, but I am. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. We were in Psalm 71 this morning, but tonight we're going to go to Psalms 37. We're going to begin reading there in verse number 1. Psalms chapter 37, verse number 1. Stand and we'll read the word of the Lord together. If you're visiting with us tonight, we are delighted that you're here. I don't know. I see new faces, and so I'm not really, really, really sure if you've been coming and I just haven't seen you or else you're a visitor. But if you are visiting with us, we are thrilled to death to have you with us tonight. We want you to just jump right in here and worship the Lord with us. Amen. We don't care where you're from, how much money you got, what color your skin is, or what political party you're a part of. You're part of the uh, family of God, then you're welcome. Amen. We are thrilled for you to be in this place tonight. Amen. Psalms 37 and 1, if you're there, say amen. David said, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Woo, hallelujah. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Woo. You know, if we're not careful sometimes, we'll see the ungodly and they're prospering and having a good time and making a lot of money. And if we're not careful, envy will set up in our heart. Oh, I'm preaching good right there. We need to be careful, don't we? But he said, don't, don't let envy get in your heart. When you see the wicked prospering, just hang on. It's all right. And then he tells us why in verse 2. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. I can tell you, it may look like they're doing really good right now, but it ain't going to last long. <laughs> and you may not be doing so good right now, but honey, if you're a child of God and you're on your way to heaven and you're rapture ready, honey, yours is going to last for eternity. Woo, shout now. Amen. Hallelujah. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, withers the green herb. Here's what we should do. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land. I love this. And verily thou shalt be fed. David said, I was young once and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Woo, hallelujah. God will take care of you if you will trust in him and follow him. And I love verse 4, really where I'm going to preach tonight. He said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Woo! That's shouting ground if I ever said it. Amen. God said if we would delight in him, he would give us the desires of our heart. We're going to talk about that. And then look at verse 5. It's a little different in the original. I'll, bring, I'll come back to that if the Lord will help me. It said, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thine righteousness. I love this, as the light. In other words, if you'll trust in him and do good, that your righteousness is going to be like a beacon, a beacon, like a lighthouse. Everywhere you go, it's going to shine, shine, shine out to a lost and a dying world. Woo. Man, I sure want my light to shine, don't you said thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday and then I love verse 7 rest in the Lord and do what wait patiently uh oh have you ever prayed Lord give me patience and do it right now <laughs> amen Woo. I prayed that a few times brother Dennis I'm guilty sometimes we have to wait don't we he said wait patiently for him. The Lord to help me, I want to preach on are you fretting or delighting? Are you fretting or delighting? Would you ask the Lord to help us? Father, what a great joy, honor, and privilege it is to be in this place tonight. Lord, I just feel humbled in my heart to even be asked to come and speak, Lord. I pray you'll come and move in a mighty way. Lord, I thank you for what I feel in the house. I thank you for this wonderful church and these wonderful people. Thank you for the chances, Lord, that just dear, dear friends of mine, some of the greatest friends I've ever had. 
Lord, I, I just feel your presence in this place, and I want, I want to be able to preach like I feel it, Lord. I want to be able to help this church tonight. Lord, would you come and just lay your hand on me and help me? Lord, would you just come and anoint me with a fresh anointing, God, with fresh fire from heaven? Will you let the power of God begin to move in this place? Oh, would you work miracles in this house, Lord, and in our hearts? Don't let us leave this house like we came, but let us leave better. Lord, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and all the glory. Ask it in Jesus' name. All of God's folks said amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Are you fretting or are you delighting? The 37th Psalm was written by David himself, probably one of the greatest psalmists that there ever was. And it seems to have been written in a time of great trouble and trials in his life. I mean, in a time of turmoil. I mean, things were going on around him that he wasn't happy about. He named them evil things, evil things, and there were people that were doing evil, and it seemed like the more evil they were, the more prosperous they were, and it was aggravating David, amen. As a matter of fact, David began to fret about that, fret about that. Well, I, I was looking at that one day, and I, I said, Lord, I need to know what that means. So I looked up the word fret in the Hebrew dictionary. It means to burn to burn, to become heated or inflamed, to blaze up in zeal, to burn with anger or to be displeased, amen. It's a very strong word in the Hebrew language. And so David literally here is burning with anger at the things that were going on around him and the more wicked and vile and evil they were, the more they seemed to prosper in David. He just couldn't figure it out out. Hallelujah. He's having a, a problem with that. Well, I can sympathize with him. Amen. We live in a very wicked world. We live in a very ungodly time. I've never seen America in the condition that America is in tonight. And there's wickedness and evil and trouble on every hand. Let me just give you an example of something that makes me burn in my heart. Abortion. Abortion. I mean, when I wasn't even a Christian, I didn't believe in abortion. I didn't believe it was a, a person's right to take a, a baby's life from its mother's womb. I just felt like even when I wasn't even a Christian that that was wrong and unethical. But when I became a child of God, that increased exponentially. I believe that it is the taking of a human life and God is not happy with that. The tragedy is that those that are taking our baby's lives are doing it and they're getting filthy rich by doing it. Amen. Planned Parenthood is a multi-billion dollar a year industry and they're taking the lives of our babies. And I was reading the other day and it broke my heart that the it's vastly disproportional in the black community. They are killing way more proportionately in the black community and that breaks my heart. Why? Because I love my black brothers and sisters. Amen. Whether they're in the church are out of it. I love every one of them and I don't want them to die. And I'm thinking about Black Lives Matters and I thought, wow, if it really mattered to some of them, they would go down and protest at the abortion clinic and try to stop some of that. And so it's a very wicked time. I was thinking about some of our politicians in Washington. I mean, we elected them to go there and to help our country, but it seems like like that they went there to destroy it. It seems like they're doing everything in their power to take us down. And I was thinking about that. And please don't be offended at me. But I'm going to just give you an example. An example of that is Bernie Sanders. And I was amazed in the last election that a lot of the millennials that are coming up now, they voted for Bernie Sanders. Well, we live in a free country and we can vote for whoever we want to vote for. Amen. Man, that's the good thing about America, and you have that right. But 
I, I was uh, uh, sitting around a table with a lot of young people. I have a lot of interaction with them. I, I do youth camps all over the world. Brother Graham has been there. He knows. Uh, we have large, large youth camps. Uh, and I have a lot of young people uh, that love Papa Hanks. Uh, and I'm sitting around the table with them. Uh, and we're talking. Uh, and some of them uh, brought that up. Uh, and I said, do you know what he stands for? Uh, and they looked at me kind of funny. Uh, and I said, uh, he is a socialist. Uh, you know what a socialist is, church? Uh, hey, man, it's a communist at heart. Uh, but he just uh, doesn't have the power right now uh, to take what's yours uh, and take it for himself. Hey, Amen. So he is a socialist at heart, and their desire is to take America down. Well, I've been to Cuba, I've been to Russia, I've been to China, I've been to Nicaragua, I've been to some of those places where socialism and communism has taken over, and guess what? They're trying to get out of there and come here. Amen. That ought to tell us something right there. I said, that ought to tell us something right there. They're trying to get here, and we're trying trying to get there. Oh, help me now. I'm not trying to be political. I'm going to make a point. And so he's a socialist, and their desire is to take America down. Well, when Bernie Sanders went to Washington, he went there broke because he had never had a real job. And But now he's a multimillionaire. Amen. He's a multimillionaire. I read last week where he has three homes. The cheapest one is four Four hundred and nine thousand dollars, nearly a half a million dollars, and that was the cheap one. I live; my house cost me forty thousand dollars. Amen. Nine hundred and fifty square feet, built sixty-six years ago. Amen. But I've lived in it and done the work of the Lord around the world, and so I'm thinking, wow! Now he's got three mansions, and he's worth millions of dollars. But he wants to redistribute my wealth. Hallelujah! And so. I had a brilliant idea. I said, Mr. Sanders, if you want to redistribute the wealth, why don't you give us yours? Hallelujah. Hey, Amen. And so he went to Washington broke, and now he's a millionaire. Amen. And he's trying to take us down. So I don't know about you, but that kind of aggravates me. And nothing, something else that's been aggravating me. I, I, I'm really aggravated at them that are tearing down our monuments and trying to destroy our history. Hallelujah. I love this country. I'm an American. I'm a patriot. And I don't like that. And so I feel like David. David looked around and he saw all of the wickedness all around him. And it looked like they were prospering. Brother Jose looked like they were being blessed better than anybody and David began to burn in his heart with anger hallelujah and some of us have been, been angry too like David have we not and so David David had to come to grips with that and he did he did I started to title this get a grip <laughs> get a grip Amen. David got a grip on that. One day it just dawned on him. One day the light came on. One day God, I guess, revealed to him the situation, Brother Dennis. One day he figured it out. Hey, there is going to be a, a day of judgment. Hallelujah. It may not be today or tomorrow or next week or next year, but God is a just God, and God is going to bring about righteous judgment. Amen. And that settled it for David. I came by to tell Pahokee tonight that our God is a just God and our God will not allow the ungodly and the wicked to go on forever. Let them enjoy their time now. Let them prosper now because they're prospering. It's going to be for a very short period of time but you and I that love him are going to rejoice and magnify our God throughout all of eternity. Hallelujah. And so David got a grip on it. Uh, David began to realize uh, that God was big enough uh, to take care of that. Uh, and so uh, David gives us uh, uh, some good advice. Uh, and I think especially in the day that you and I are living in tonight, he gives us some great advice. Notice uh, he said, fret not thyself uh, because uh, of evildoers. Uh, man, what a uh, thought. Uh, fret 
not yourself because of evildoers. Don't worry about it, folks. God's got it all under control. God knows exactly what he's doing, and he's doing well at it. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. And then I love verse 2 because there he tells us why. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And so there is a day of retribution that is going to come for the wicked. And so in fret, instead of fretting, David suggests to us some things that we ought to be doing instead of fretting. Instead of fretting. I want to share them real quickly with you tonight. Look at verse 3 if you still have your Bible open. He said, trust in the Lord and do good. And so the first thing David suggests to you and I is that we trust in the Lord and do good. Amen. I think that's pretty good advice, don't you? To trust in the Lord and to do good. Barnes Notes had this to say about this verse and I had to write it down. It said, trust in the Lord. Confide in Him. Rest on Him. Instead of allowing the mind to be disturbed and sad because there are wicked men upon the earth and because they are prosperous and apparently happy because they will injure you in your person or your reputation. Calmly confide in God. Woo, hallelujah. Calmly confide in God. Leave it all in his hands. Man, I read that. I said, thank you, Lord, I needed that. Come on, I needed that because my heart has been aggravated lately. My heart has trembled before the Lord. My heart has been grieved over some of the stuff going on. I needed that. Notice what he said again, calmly confide in God. Leave all of that in his hands. Sometimes we just got to give it up to him, don't we? Sometimes we just got to hand it over to the Lord and let him take care of it. Isn't that what the, the writer in Proverbs really meant in saying Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6 when he said trust in the Lord with what? With all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Oh hallelujah. I want to trust him tonight. I want to believe him. Somebody shout amen. And then he said we're to trust in the Lord. Notice second we're to do good. We're to do good. That means we're to live right. We're to live right. One writer wrote, he said, many more folks would be Christians if it wasn't for Christians. Really? Many more people would be Christians if it wasn't for Christians. Listen, God has delivered us from sin and set us free. He sanctified us and filled many of us with the Holy Ghost. And if you're not full, you need to get in the altar tonight and pray till God fills you. <laughs> Amen. But listen, that's not where it stops. We have to do good. He said we got to trust in the Lord and do good. We got to do what is right. We got to live right. So can I ask you tonight, are you living right? Are you saved? Amen. Are you a genuine, born-again child of the living God? Because if you're not, you're missing out on the grandest blessing on this side of heaven. Amen. And if you're not a Christian, then tonight in this altar, you can come and give your heart and your life to the Lord, and he will absolutely transform it and turn you in to another creature. Hallelujah. And so we need to trust in the Lord and do good. And then notice a second. He said instead of fretting, we ought to be delighting ourselves in the Lord. We ought to be delighting ourselves in the Lord. Verse 4, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say we're to delight ourselves in our money or our houses or our spouses or our possessions or even our family. We are to delight ourselves in the Lord. Hallelujah. What does that mean, Brother Hanks? It means that there is no more important relationship in our life 
life than our relationship with him. Amen. That's what it means, church. I think somehow we've forgotten that in our generation. Hear me. There's no more important relationship in your life than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on. Amen. Oh, it's good to be married. I've been married a couple of weeks ago, 46 years, to the same woman. Amen. We dated four years, so she's had to put up with me 50 years. I told her 46 years ago, baby, I took you for better or worse. Worse, I couldn't have done better, and you couldn't have done worse. <laughs> Amen. It's been wonderful. Somebody said, Sister Hanks must be a good woman. She is. She is. But she's not the most important thing in my life. I have a house, not much to it, but I have a house. But that's not what's important to me. Amen. I have a ministry, and I've been all over the world. But that's, that's not the most important thing to Brother Hanks tonight. The most important thing to me, Brother Graham, is my relationship with God. Amen. Did you hear that? Sometimes if we're not careful, church, we'll get caught up with all that other stuff and we don't give God his rightful place. Come on. There's no more important relationship in your life or mine than our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like we have forgotten that in our generation. Today, many church folks, they put everything ahead of God. Think about that. That's why a lot of them are Sunday morning saints. They don't come back on Sunday night. You know why? Because something or somebody has become more important to them than him. Thank you. I got a one. That's right. Amen. Something has become more important to them than him. That's a reason some of them don't pay tithes and give in the offerings because something is more important to them than him. That's why some people never, never seek him really earnestly and they never do anything for him because something has become more important to them than him. Now I can almost hear some of you, but Brother Hanks, we're old. What can we do? Well, I already told you about an 80 plus year old woman but I tell you there's one thing you can do if you can't do anything else you can pray you can pray, hallelujah. I was reading a story a few weeks ago about one of the greatest revivals in all history. It was called the Lewis Isles Revival. Powerful, powerful move of God, unbelievable. You know how it started? Two old ladies. <laughs> Two old ladies, that's right. They had spinal stenosis. That means curvature of the spine plus a million other things. They could barely get out of bed at times. They couldn't even go to church. I mean, think about that. They couldn't even go to the house of God. But oh, they looked around and they saw the wickedness and the evil and the ungodliness that was around them, Brother Michael. And they began to grieve in their heart. They began to get upset in their heart. And so they made a covenant together. We're going to begin to fast and we're going to begin to pray and we're going to believe God to send a mighty revival. Hallelujah. And them two old ladies that could barely get out of the bed started fasting and praying and all of a sudden God gave one of them a vision and when she had the vision they called the local pastor. He came to their house and they said to him, said, are you thoroughly right with God? Man, what a question. Ooh, I wouldn't want to ask some preachers that. I can't hide behind that one. Amen. Are you thoroughly right with God? He assured him that he was. The old lady said, then God is going to send a mighty awakening. He's going to pack the churches out. There's going to be people saved by the thousands. And little did he realize they were right. Hallelujah. And the Lewis Island revival broke out. And literally thousands upon thousands of people were born again. And it all was traced back to the prayers of two old ladies that could hardly even get out of the bed. I'm telling you tonight, church, God wants to do something great in our generation. I said he wants to do something great in our generation. Then the way we're going to get him to do it is we're going to have to learn as believers, ready, how to delight ourselves in the Lord. We're going to have to learn how to delight ourselves in the Lord. Now, I want to just talk about that. The word delight here literally means to take pleasure in. We, we understand that. 
As genuine Christians, our greatest delight should be in Him. Thank you, Brother Chansky. Our greatest delight should be in Him. Amen. Now, this is where I really want to get to meat of the preaching, and we're going to shout at the end and have church around the altar, okay? Hear me now. When we truly love God and delight in Him, then we begin to have a transformation that begins to take place in our life. Something begins to happen in us. What is that, Brother Hanks? Well, first, we begin to reflect God's character. As we begin to love Him and delight in Him and get close to Him and seek Him, then we begin to become like Him. See that? We begin to come become like Him. See, the more time you spend with somebody, the more you're going to become like them. <laughs> Sister Hanks and I, we've been married so long until we finish each other's sentences. Brother Wayne, you have the same problem at your house? Yeah, I figured. Now, people say, hmm, y'all look like brother and sister. Man, am I glad I rubbed off on her. Don't tell her I said that. When we get around somebody, we become like them. That's why, listen to me, young people, that's why that Papa Hanks and Pastor Graham and your mom and your dad and your grandma and your grandpa is always telling you, be careful who you hang out with. Because whoever you hang out with the most is who you're going to be most like. That's good advice for adults too. Amen. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever seen somebody just had a nice sweet uh, demeanor about them uh, and they begin to hang out with the wrong crowd, uh, some, some old uh, mis- disgruntled church member somewhere, and the next thing you know, that kind little sweet demeanor person became uh, ugly and mean like the other person. Uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Come on. Amen. Uh, whoever you hang out with the most uh, is who you're going to be the most like. Uh, and so you and I as believers uh, ought to have a great and earnest desire in our heart to hang out with God. Hallelujah. Amen. And if we'll hang out with him, the more we hang out with him, the more we take on his characteristics and his likeness and the sweeter we become and the better we become and then we can trust in him and then we can do good because he gives us the power and the ability to do it. Amen. Whoa. Hallelujah. That's good preaching right there. I was reading about Merv Griffin. Some of you are too young to remember him but us old timers uh, we remember Merv Griffin hallelujah and he was interviewing Charlton Heston one day and he said Charlton uh, you played a lot of religious characters uh, in your acting career he said I have a question for you yes sir Merv what is that Uh, he said which one uh, had the most spiritual impact uh, on your life Uh, uh, Charlton never even thought about it he just blurted it out definitely Moses (laughs) And so Merv was interested in that. He said, well, Charlton, why, did, why, why Moses? He said, Merv, you can't climb up a mountain and spend 40 days in the presence of God and come down from that mountain the same way you went up. You remember when Moses hung out on the mountain for 40 days? And he came down and they had to put a veil over his face because the glory of the Lord had permeated his whole being. And the, his light shone like that of an angel. And they had to veil his face. You remember that, don't you? Why? Because the closer he got to God and the more he hung out with God, the more God got in him. Listen to me, young people. Hang out with Jesus. Hang out with God. Hang out with the church crowd. Hallelujah. Leave that worldly crowd alone. Leave that sinner crowd alone. Leave them drug dealers alone. Leave them pimps alone. Amen. They're not going to help you. But I can tell you, if you'll get in the presence of the Lord and you'll get full of the Holy Ghost, God will help you to live right in a wicked, evil world. Somebody shout amen right there. Hallelujah. So you can't, you can't spend 40 days and not be the same. 
you're going to be changed. Hallelujah. The more you delight in him, then the more you're going to become like him. And then second, not only do you begin to reflect God's character, but second, notice, I love this one, you begin to receive God's blessings. Ooh, I like that. You begin to receive God's blessing. Look at it again, verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Ooh, hallelujah. Man, that's shouting ground right there. That is good. Now, notice two words here. I think sometimes we get them all mixed up. Two words here we need to look at. Both of them begin with D. The first one is delight, and the second one is desires. I want you to notice the order. He said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and then he shall give thee the desires of your heart. See the order? (laughs) The desires come after the delight. (laughs) See that? The desires come after the delight. We have to learn how to delight ourselves in the Lord. And if we never learn that, then we're never going to have the the blessings of the Lord like we should. Hallelujah. You see, some people think that this verse verse literally means that we just go to God and say, Oh, God, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not what it means at all. That's as far away from the meaning as it could be. That's not it. What it means is, as we delight ourselves in him, we become like him. See that? As we begin to delight ourselves in the Lord and hang out with him, we begin to become like him. And when we begin to become like him, then we want what he wants. We desire in our life what he desires for us to have in our lives. See that? And as we begin to desire what he desires, then when we pray, he's always going to give us the desires of our heart because our desires literally have become his desires. See that? Listen to Brother Hanks now. Listen very carefully. That doesn't come easily, and that doesn't come quickly. I want to say that again. It doesn't come easy, easily and it doesn't come quickly. We want his blessings and we want them now. I was reading the other day some incidences of people, Sister Ezekiel, that We're actually thanking God. This sounds crazy, but it's true. They were thanking God for not answering their prayer. Think about that. They were thanking the Lord that he did not answer their prayer. Why? Because they finally came to a place in their life when they realized that had God answered their prayer, it would have messed them up totally. It would have been the worst thing that he could have ever done for them. And so they finally realized that. When they got close to him, then his desires began to become their desires and they realized that his desire was better than theirs. I'm telling you tonight, church, that God's desire for our lives is much better than what we could even imagine for our own life. Are you hearing me? God wants to do unbelievable things through you and through me if we'll just get in his presence and allow him to have his will and way in our heart. He's going to use us in a powerful and in a wonderful way. And we have a very wonderful example of that in 1 Kings chapter 3. You may remember uh, King David. We, uh, he wrote this psalm, and uh, he had a son by the name of Solomon. Amen. 
And Solomon became king when David died. Remember that? Or actually before David died. Remember that? And then he went to Gibeah. And in Gibeah, they're offering up all these sacrifices, hundreds, thousands of them. I mean, they're having them a time, praise God. They're having church. And that night, uh, Solomon went to bed. And in, in his, when he went to bed, he went to sleep. And, and God came to him in a dream. And he said, Solomon, ask me what you will. Oh, man. You know what God was saying to Solomon? Hey, here it is, son. I'm giving you a blank check. Just make it out. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Now, if that would have been us, we probably would have said, Lord, give me fame and fortune. <laughs> Come on. Give me fame and fortune. Hallelujah. That's what we want. That's what them NFL players want. They want fame and fortune, and they're getting it. Amen. But, but Solomon, what did he ask for? Did he ask for fame and fortune? No, sir. No, no. What did he ask for? He asked for wisdom to guide God's people. Man, what a request. He realized that the enormity of the task was bigger than he was. And he needed God. I'm telling you, church, we're facing things today we never faced before. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to handle it. God's going to have to. Some of you parents, amen, you're facing things with your children my mother never had to face. You're, you're, I mean, they're exposed to things that I was never exposed to. And it's going to take the grace of God to keep them out of the penitentiary. It's going to take the grace of God to keep them out of the drug life and the sex life and the drinking and carousing life. It's going to take God. Amen. We need God's wisdom to lead us and guide us in the right way. And Solomon knew that. He said, oh God, I'm not asking for fame or fortune, Lord. I'm just asking you to give this little old boy the wisdom that I need to guide your people. That's what I pray for as a pastor. When I pastored, I said, Lord, just give me the wisdom like Solomon to guide these people because I don't want to lead them in the wrong direction. Guess what God did? He gave Solomon what he asked for. Didn't he? He gave Solomon what he asked for. Not only did he give him what he asked for, but he gave him more of it than any other man has ever had on this planet outside of Jesus. Whoa. Hang with me now. Want to shout a little bit right here? See, God was hoping that Solomon was going to ask for that wisdom. And he did. So Solomon was really asking God for what God desired him to ask. See that? When we begin to delight ourselves in the Lord and we begin to have God's mind and God's will and God's desire in our heart, then we begin to do the same thing. And we don't care about money and we don't care about fame and we don't care about all that. We just want God whatever you want, whatever you want to do with us. We're open to that. And when that happens, then God can begin to move. And so Solomon asked for what God really wanted him to ask for. Solomon gave it, or God gave it to Solomon and more than any other human outside of Jesus on this planet but then he did something else. Not only did he give him wisdom, he gave him what he didn't ask for. See that? He gave him fame and fortune. See that, church? See that, church? God could give you a whole lot more if you were more like him. God could give you a whole lot more if you were more like him. He can't trust some people with money because it would turn their heart away from him. He can't trust some people with responsibility because it would go to their head and they would think they knew more than God. I'm preaching really good. But when our delight is in him, then we get in his presence. and We begin to seek him. and We find his mind and his will. And God can do absolutely unbelievable things in our lives. Man, 
man, that's good preaching right there. I want that to sink in. Church, we live way beneath our privilege. God could use us in a far greater way than he has, but he can't trust us because we haven't been delighting ourselves in him. Our delight is in the world and the things that are in the world, so he can't give us the things that he really wants us to have. Some of you could have the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life, but other things are more important to you than the gifts of the Spirit. Some of you could be missionaries, and God could use you in an unbelievable way, but the problem is other things have become more important to you than doing God's will in your life. God could anoint you in a greater way, but you're more concerned with the television than you are a prayer closet. And so God can't anoint you like he really wants to. Now, are you understanding the, the, the ramifications here? He said you need to delight yourself in the Lord. And when he, Solomon did, he got what he asked for, and then he got more than he asked for. Third and last, not only do we reflect God's character, and receive God's blessings. But I love this one. Now we have a place to leave our burdens. Commit thy way unto the Lord. of you are just like this. Heavy weight on you. The word commit means to roll it off. So you got this heavy burden you brought to church tonight, but you're going to get in the altar and you're going to take that heavy burden and you're going to roll it off on the Lord. That's what it means. It means to roll it off, to roll it off, to roll it off, to roll it off. Amen. I want to tell you tonight that you can roll it off on the Lord. Whoa, I feel the Holy Ghost. I said, I want to tell you tonight that you can roll it off on the Lord. Amen. Some of you came in here burning down, but I'm telling you, you're going to leave here different and you came, you're going to roll it off on the Lord in this altar and God is going to touch you and help you in this place tonight. Somebody lift your hands up and worship the Lord right now. Somebody praise him in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, glory to God. We can roll them off on him. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, then we have a place that we can go to to, get, to unload that heavy burden. We can go to the Lord and roll them off on him and he will help us carry that heavy load hallelujah is there something troubling you then you need to get in this altar tonight and pray is there something weighing you down then you need to get in the altar and pray is there something holding you back from being what God wants you to be or doing what God wants you to do then get in the altar and pray until that burden is lifted and the Lord delivers you and sets you free Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Finally, when we do that, something amazing happens. Verse 7, then we can rest in the Lord. We can rest in the Lord. When we delight ourselves in Him and commit our way to Him, roll our burdens off on him, then what does he do? He gives us rest. Woo, he gives us rest. The writer wrote, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come on to me and rest. Oh, weary one, bow down with care. Come lean upon my breast. There is no load that I cannot bear, nor burden that I will not share. So cast on me thine every care. Come unto me and rest. <laughs>
Hallelujah. As I've been traveling around this world, you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing a lot of burdened people. I've seen a lot of people that are weighed down and loaded down when all they have to do is run to the Lord and they could unload that heavy burden. Sinner, you're here tonight. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? You you can bring that heavy burden to the Lord and you can cast it on him in this altar tonight. That's what Jesus meant in Matthew 11, 28. When he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Hallelujah. You see, you'll never find real rest for your soul until you find the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that can give us rest for our soul. Jesus is the only one that can help Help us with the load of sin that we carry, sinner. You'll never carry a heavier load than the load of sin. There's not a heavier one. Did you hear what I said? I remember the night as a 19-year-old boy in a little church of God in Groveland, Florida. I went in that night messed up. I'm talking about messed up. I'd just gotten out of a detention center. Amen. I just got out on a Friday. I walked into that little church of God on a Sunday night and they sang and they testified and they shouted and they ran and they preached and they had church and every time they testified it was like God was sticking a knife in my heart and every time the preacher preached I thought he was preaching right at me amen I was wanting him to hush so I could go to the altar honey when he slowed down I I tore out of that pew I hit that altar and I prayed through that night 19 years of age and God miraculously, gloriously marvelously, wondrously saved my wretched soul and gave me a brand new heart and a brand new life and a brand new direction and he'll do it for you. I still remember mama walking out of that church that night. It seemed like Sister Louisa that there was a million pounds that had been lifted off of my shoulders. I felt free as a bird. Oh I tell you it was that load of sin and killed and it weighed me down for 19 years but it was gone hallelujah and now I can rest in him Woo! hallelujah Oh, sinner, you ought to shout a little bit right there. He wants to lift your heavy burden tonight. He wants to let you go free just like he did me and just like he did Graham Chancey and just like he did the others that are in this place tonight. And God wants to do something marvelous and unbelievable in your life if you'll just come to him. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In a service one night, The preacher got overwhelmed preaching, just got beside himself. And he was preaching from Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He got so beside himself, all he could say is, come unto me, church. What does it mean? Come unto me, church. What does it mean? There's a little seven-year-old girl sitting on the front row. She shot her hand up. And the, the man looked around and saw her hand. Said, yes, baby. What does it mean to you? Said, preacher, it means to me that he, Jesus, chose me. He chose me. Woo! Hallelujah. Oh, that reminds me of a story I read about somebody. They adopted a little boy. They adopted a little boy. And the the little girl, the real girl, the real heir, the real one, she didn't like it. And so she's taunting this little boy, just always taunting this little boy, always aggravating this little boy and saying, oh, I'm the real one. You're adopted. And man is just tearing that little boy's heart out. But one day, I believe it was the Holy Ghost. Amen. You believe whatever you want. One day, God got a hold of that little boy and he, he shut her up. I mean, he stopped her dead in her tracks. All of a sudden, he just stopped and looked at her said, well, I'll tell you about that. He said, they had to take you, but they chose me. <laughs> wow! 
hallelujah. They had to take you, but they chose me. Can I tell you, he chose me. Amen, he chose me. When that little girl said that, they said it was like a hush went across that audience. And all of a sudden, from one side or the other of that congregation, they began to sob and weep and praise God. They realized for the first time that God had loved them enough that he chose them. He handpicked them. He t- picked them out of seven and a half billion people. I'm telling you tonight, if you've been born again, you've been handpicked by God himself. Hallelujah. You belong to the Lord. He chose you. Amen. Oh, amen. Did you hear that, saint? Did you hear that? He chose you. He chose me. He chose us. And he will give us rest. I got a quick. Come on, Melody. Amen. You may be here tonight, saint of God, and you may be carrying a very heavy load. Well, I just came by to tell you, you can get rid of that in this altar tonight. You can cast that burden on the Lord. The Bible said, and he will sustain you. Think about it, saints. I, I was thinking today, as I, as I was getting ready for this, I was thinking about a, 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 a in LaBelle, we did we had VBS. We love VBS. And Melody and Graham were there. We just had a time. Man, we had a had a blowout VBS every year. And we had we had a, a, a I don't pinwheel I guess is the right word. Uh, we had a big old wheel, a round wheel, and it was fixed in the middle and it had little pegs on it. And of course, uh, every one of them had a different saying on it. And every night, uh, whoever was good or whoever did whatever did their memory verse or whatever, they got to spin that wheel. And there was a prize on there. On some of them, there was a prize, and so they would spin that wheel. I got to thinking about that wheel today for some reason. I, you know, if you were on the outside of that wheel. I mean, that peg on the outside, he's getting a wild ride, ain't he? I mean, he just, whoo, they spin that joker. I thought sometimes it's going to fly off. I mean, they just let her rip. And boy, that on the outside of that, but guess what? Guess where the most rest is and the most peace and the less disturbance is? Right in the center. Right in the center. Amen. Come on. Are you hearing me? On the outside, you better hang on for a wild ride, but right in the center, you're just right there. And it just goes barely goes around and around and around. No big deal. Hey Amen. Think about this. When Jesus is the center of your life, you know what happens? He gives you rest. Hallelujah. Oh, there may be a little trouble here and there, but it's not like hanging on on the outside. When you put Jesus first in your life, when you put him at the center of your life, Jesus comes and gives you rest. Somebody in this house needs some rest tonight. Some of you have been toiling and laboring. Some of you have been going through the battle and a hard time and a heated time. I came by to tell you, Jesus has rest for you and he can help you in this altar. Stand with me all over the house. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over the house. So I need to ask you tonight, have you been fretting or have you been delighting? Too many of us and I've been guilty of it and the Lord had to chasten me over and I I, I was fretting too much and I just got in that prayer closet this week and I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm tired of fretting over it. You're, you're going to take care of it. I'm not, I don't care who wins the election. I don't care. You're in charge. The Bible said he setteth up one and putteth down another. So whoever he wants, it's going to be the president in the next go around. Amen. Why should I worry my head over that? Why should I have a stroke over that? Why should I get all bent out of shape? He's in charge of it, not I. Amen. What I want to do is I want to get in his presence and I want to be more like him. I want to become more like him. I want his desire to be my desire, his will, my will. And when I get there, honey, God is going to do something bigger and better in my life than he ever has before.